Our second reading this morning is uh, from Psalm 118, verses 19 through 29. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them, and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and God has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. For God's steadfast love endures forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Writer Damon Young confesses that it, it was his thing not to dance the electric slide. He wanted to die never having learned the electric slide, to be the guy at the party who always sits through it. But a few weeks ago, when he and his wife had spent another whole day with their small kids and his wife was desperate to wear them out before bedtime, he found himself doing the electric slide all through his living room. He goes on to say that a byproduct of the coronavirus has been recognizing what matters and what doesn't. A shedding of habits, assumptions, and practices we thought were essential. The palms for Palm Sunday weren't delivered this, this week, and I think I can speak for all of us when I say, so what? I read an article predicting all sorts of positive changes coming out of the stay-at-home orders, including the demilitarization of American patriotism, a decline in polarization, a return to having faith in serious experts, and the end of our romance with hyper-individualism. For some folks, the coronavirus has spawned a renewal of gratitude. During Lent here at Calvary, along with scripture, we're studying the eight pillars of joy explored by Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama in the Book of Joy. We're learning about turning our mourning into dancing, to quote Psalm 30. The pillar we explore today is gratitude. I don't believe any of the other pillars are as well researched and documented as gratitude. Mountains of research show that practicing gratitude reduces heart disease, fights depression and anxiety, improves sleep, increases resilience, reduces stress, makes us more compassionate, and on and on. Study after study show that people aren't grateful because they're joyful, but rather they're joyful because they're grateful. Gratitude, it seems, is God's wonder drug. We sure could use a wonder drug about now, couldn't we? Now, you might be thinking, gratitude? Really? During the COVID-19 pandemic? Being forced to stay at home? Rising infection and death rates? the economy in tatters, insufficient if not incompetent governmental response? Yes, believe it or not, yes. In the midst of these difficulties, millions of people are realizing just how much we've taken for granted. Our health, travel, socializing, and even ordinary trips to the grocery store. People notice 
what they miss. And according to Jesuit author Father James Martin, noticing is the beginning of gratitude. Noticing is the beginning of gratitude. We get a glimpse of how this works in Matthew's version of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem during Passover. The crowd begins to sing Psalm 118, our psalm for today. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They've probably been singing it for a while, just as they did each Passover. Matthew makes it clear, however, that Jesus didn't just happen to ride into Jerusalem when a crowd was standing by the road singing Psalm 118. The people were singing their thanksgiving for Jesus because they'd seen what he'd done. Perhaps in that crowd was Zacchaeus, who'd been forgiven his sins, or Bartimaeus, who'd been given his sight. Maybe people in that crowd had seen Jesus stand up to the authorities and heal on the Sabbath. Maybe they'd heard him say, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Or, let those little children come to me, for of such is God's kingdom. Maybe they understood that when he described God's kingdom, he was saying that life didn't have to be as grim and oppressive as it was with Caesar's foot on their necks, but rather with God as the ruler of their hearts and minds, life could be free and expansive and abundant. Whatever they'd heard, they'd been paying attention. They'd noticed Jesus, they'd noticed what he'd said and done, and they were grateful. You can't be grateful for something you don't notice. Brother David Stendhal Rast writes that we all notice things that surprise us, like a rainbow, for instance. A complete stranger might pull on your sleeve, or at least before social distancing anyway, and point to the sky and say, did you notice the rainbow? There's always something surprising about a rainbow. It, it feels like a gift. When something feels like a gift, like those thank God moments, we feel grateful. When someone recovers from a dire illness or the police find the passport you thought you'd lost or your child gets into the school she wanted or the giants make it into the playoffs. And as we're learning, it's certainly easier to notice things when we miss them, isn't it? Maybe you miss going to your favorite restaurant, hanging out in person with friends, attending worship in the sanctuary, or hugs. I miss hugs. But if we want regular access, not just occasional, but regular access to the wonder drug of gratitude, our challenge is to notice ordinary things and experiences all the time. How might we learn to do this? There's an old joke, you've probably heard it. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Choir, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. Practice, practice, practice. practice. That's how we get to gratitude as well. The Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu treat gratitude as a practice because practicing gratitude during ordinary times gives us the resilience and strength we need in the worst of times. And so some people keep a gratitude journal, some just include gratitude as part of their prayers. Anyone can take a moment each day, maybe before you go to bed, asking, what happened today that made me smile? What happened that touched my heart? This trains our minds to notice they might be small things, a conversation with a friend, the hummingbird you saw outside your window, or the satisfaction of completing a task. When we're busy, moments like these can slip by unnoticed. If we make a practice of noticing, it directs our gaze toward the good in the world and in other people. But what if you don't feel like practicing? What if that's just all too much right now. As a child, I can remember looking at my plate just before my family said grace and thinking, I 
really wasn't very grateful for what was there. Maybe it was lima beans or creamed corn. My parents, like most people who grew up during the Depression, weren't shy about telling me that I should be grateful that I had food at all. But the thing is, that didn't make me feel more grateful. It made me feel more guilty, but not more grateful. You can't force someone to feel gratitude, and I don't think you can force yourself either. So what do you do then if your life feels more like a plate of lima beans than a plate of coconut cream pie right now? I know people who are really struggling. Is it even possible in times of plague to feel or to practice gratitude? We know it's possible because of people like Martin Rinkart. In the 1600s, Rinkart served as the pastor to the people in Eilenburg, a walled city in the part of Germany known as Saxony. The 30 years of his pastorate coincided with the terrible 30 years war. Refugees from the surrounding countryside poured into Eilenburg for protection. It didn't take long for famine and plague to set in. In 1637 alone, 8,000 people in Eilenburg died of the disease, including other clergy, most of the town council, and Rinkert's own wife. Rinkert was left to minister to the entire city, sometimes preaching at burial services for as many as 200 dead in one week. He gave away everything he owned except for the barest essentials that he needed to care for his family. But in the heart of that darkness, he sat down and wrote this table grace for his children. Now thank we all our God, with heart and hands and voices, who wondrous things hath done, in whom his world rejoices, who from our mother's arms hath led us on our way with countless gifts of love, and still is ours today. Later, the prayer was put to music, and we'll sing it this morning. Perhaps Rinkert arrived at this place of gratitude in the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. Or perhaps Rinkert noticed what he missed, and that made him grateful for what he had. Maybe the lessons of the plague stuck with Rinkert. Maybe the lessons from this virus will stick with us. Don't misunderstand me. I am not grateful for the coronavirus, not at all. But I am grateful for some of the lessons it is teaching me. Suddenly, productivity is not the primary value, but connection, affection, love, and encouragement are. In this pause of sheltering in place, we are remembering neighbors and kindness, mutuality and empathy. A man in Italy who actually had the virus reports, it changed me. I understand the importance of things that used to seem insignificant, things that signify living, breathing, a walk, a hug, a glass of wine, because this virus wants to take that away from you. It would be callous, cruel even, to prescribe gratitude right now to those who are suffering deeply. I'm thinking about the folks who are sick or who have lost loved ones. I'm also thinking about those who a few weeks ago were going about their lives, bartending, cleaning, waiting tables, loading luggage and teaching yoga, and then suddenly they were in a free fall without work. But gratitude is not a denial of harsh reality, nor is it complacence about injustice. Gratitude is not about pasting it on a happy face and ignoring the facts. In fact, research shows that grateful people don't ignore or deny the negative. They just choose to appreciate what's positive as well. Gratitude is actually motivating because it keeps us from slipping into despair. Remember that Psalm 118 was sung at Passover 
the holiday that celebrates that God freed the Hebrew people from slavery. In the Exodus, God miraculously changed the way things were. God overthrew the most powerful nation in the world to create hope for those who had no hope. So the Psalms don't teach us simply to find some reason to give thanks while still being slaves. They don't tell us to give thanks because things could always be worse. Instead, they call us to envision another way of life because as Passover reminds us, God can change the way it is. God can change the way it is. Gratitude helps us not only to recognize the blessings of God, but to proclaim a different way of life, a life of shalom, of well-being for all. Our gratitude refuses to let disappointments or injustice define us or limit God's power to act. We proclaim our faith in the God who can change the way it is and who can motivate us to help that happen when we insist along with the psalmist, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord who loves us, who can change the way it is, who can weave wonders of grace out of disaster. A Calvary member shared a poem by Kitty O'Meara that speaks to that and I am deeply grateful for that poem. Omira writes, And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows. And the people began to think differently. And the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed, and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. Amen.